are passed past within 15 minutes. He's, he's uh, 18 inches, 10 inches, 4 inches, um, are only 15 minutes later. Anytime after that, uh, all bets are off. Just a quick slide to show the different pass pass accuracy, how much variation you can end up with here. These are meters, uh, zero being right on. Um, some of these passes in, in this study were close to 30 feet off when you came back. So as to, in static accuracy, where you're where you're always in the same place, it's going to be closer in general. That's not as hard a solution, but you're still. When you're talking meters, you're, you're three feet off here in some places when, when you haven't even moved. So the one study that we were able to find that, that looked at any benefits or, uh, or penalties, there shouldn't be any penalties, but mostly benefits as the plant right on top of your zone tillage slot, was believe it or not in cotton. Couldn't find anything initially in corn. Um, they did show a pretty significant advantage to planting on the rows and cotton. And uh, they actually did an economic study and uh, saw that it, it was pretty important in that crop. But obviously, we, we want something that uh, is a little more pertinent to what we're doing here in New York State. And while they showed and larger farms, they actually studied, they compared how far off, the, the greater the area error, um, the smaller acres you could go over and, and, and see economic benefit. So this slide's a little confusing, I apologize for that, but this is, this, these figures here are uh, related to the study I was just talking about, cotton. Remember, these are 2004 numbers, so I wouldn't put a whole lot of uh, value in those absolute numbers, but the thing to, to get out of this is that the RTK, which we're saying is the only real option for doing this, is definitely a more expensive option. So we want to make sure that we're seeing some benefit out of this. Now, the bottom half of this slide is uh, numbers I generated from the systems we used in our study. The farms we're talking to, we had one farm using John Deere system, two farms using a Raven system. So what I wanted to show here in this slide is, is, the, uh, is the premium you have to pay the more accurate you get. I assumed that WASP was, was the baseline, so there, there's no premium associated with a WASP system. These numbers shown here are the additional costs involved in upgrading from that um, WAS system, which is generally considered um, by most of the manufacturers, they'll advertise it as 10 to 12 inches accurate. Pass to pass again, not, not repeatable. So to get to a four inch accuracy in the John Deere system is called their SF2 accuracy level. You have to pay 5500 extra dollars for upgrades in hardware, plus an $800 subscription. And again, I, I don't want to be the dead horse, but this is only pass to pass. So if you come back um, a day after the tillage pass and want to plant on top of this slot, you're going to have to manually line yourself back up and get started again, and, and the errors are going to accumulate as you go across the field farm in our study, Oakwood, um, they used the John Deere RTK system using a base station. Um, the hardware and software up, upgrades necessary over WASP would cost them $7,000. Now that's not all the hardware. I'm assuming they've already got the displays and things in here, so this is not total cost for the hardware. Also for a base station, would have cost them $10,000. However, they happen to have a neighbor that already had a base station, was willing to, for an annual fee, let them access that signal. So for, I, I should have looked, I think it was $1,300 a year they are able to get this signal from the neighbor. On the Raven side of things, 
their four inch accuracy level. I put this up here just for comparison purposes. Um, it would require a totally different hardware setup than what we use, but um, you can see this is the number to get to four inch accuracy past the pass. However, we use the RTK level of system, uh, required unlocks and upgrades in hardware of about $6,000. In order to, we were using the CORS network in this case, um, which is New York State's uh, DOT's correction signal, free of charge for that signal. They don't have to pay anything to access it. However, you do need a, uh, a cell phone data plan because this communicates using cellular network. <coughs> so that runs about $60 a month. And then Raven charges a $335 a, a year fee process that signal. So the whole point to this is, is, is this is some of the costs involved in being able to perform the, the process or being able to perform the procedure of putting in a slot, whatever, whatever zone tillage tool you're using, and then planning on top of it. We did find one other Actually, uh, Patty found this other study recently um, out of Oklahoma. They did not find a significant difference in being on top of the zone. It was uh, only a one-year study, yeah. though, where the previous one had used three years of field data. Exactly, and also a lot of this information in this study was, uh, or all of it, was in irrigated ground. And my opinion, and not only my opinion, is when, once you start artificially adding water, you're asking less out of the root system. So I, I would I would question whether you're going to see full benefits out of being on top of the uh, slot. So here, what are we trying to do here? In New York, locally, we know uh, we know we have a wide variety of soil types. Um, so we want to have some local information. Um, we now have precision guidance systems that can perform this operation, but we, we realized that the accuracy is very from system to system, and there's only one accuracy level we can be dealing with here to uh, guarantee where we, we are where we want to be when we go back to plant. So our hypothesis going in, our bias if you want to say, mine anyway, was that uh, Planting directly over the zone tilled spot is going to improve our yields. So, um, we've already shown you our goals, told you our goals. So, the objective and the reason, or the, I guess the method we were going to test our hypothesis is we're going to go into a field, we're going to have a, a pass where we, we used RTK to make sure we planted right over that slot. I'm going to skip down here. We also used RTK to plant <coughs> four inches off the slot and planted eight inches off the slot. And then in talking with farmers, a lot of the feedback we get when we're doing zone tillage is I can see those slots. Um, I, our planter operator can just follow visually. We have no need for any of this uh, expensive equipment. So we wanted to put this uh, test in here as well. I'll tell you up front, we didn't have much luck with that one. Uh, not because of, of any problem on the farmer's part, but the weather this spring required the farmers to do some extra tillage. They couldn't see those spots. So uh, while you see this data here, it isn't really from the practice we were looking to, to test. As stated before, we had three different sites kind of see on the map, we, we tried to spread them out. We went through and, and documented what the field was like and what the management practices were. In August, in September, early September, we, we went in ducks and root pits, to see what, what differences there might be in root growth, because that's where we're going to see our, our advantage to this system. And obviously, we measure the yields. 
And I'm going to turn it back over to Patty. She'll uh, explain what we found. So just to show you what the plots look like on the field, we did four reps of those four treatments. So for example, this would have been the RTK guided plot. This was the manually driven plot, four inches off plot, and the eight inches off plot. Then we randomized those and did it again, and then we did it again, and then a fourth time. And when you put randomized plots across the field, that's really the only way that we were going to come out at the end of the season and say that any differences, if we did find differences or see differences, that those could be attributed to what the treatments that we put on that field. We tried to document everything that we could find on each of these fields, and the management was very different. All three sites had lots of variability. So at Oakwood Dairy, this is what the field looked like when the plots were laid in. So that had been zone tilled down about eight inches and had received plenty of manure that spring. Um, there was no, uh, there wasn't any nitrogen, uh, nitrogen limitations on any of the sites. It had also been turbo disked the day it was planted, and then those plots laid out. This was what the coin field looked like on the day that we put the plots in. You can see it was a soybean field, so this was the first year corn field after soy. And on this one, you could visually see the, the zones. This was Southview Farm. Um, you could not see the zones on this field because uh, it had been prepared and then it got wet, it didn't get rain. Had heavy rain. We had heavy rain, we had to delay planting, and then it had developed a crust. So they went back over with a light tillage um, just before we put the plots in. So that's what that <coughs> We took soil tests of every single plot. We didn't find any differences, statistically uh, significant differences between the soil tests. So this is what those three sites look like. The ISNT was um, was low for uh, open and coin farm, so meaning that the soil wouldn't have provided enough nitrogen to support a uh, corn crop without additional fertilizer and manure. Whereas at Southview, it was a, the organic matter had a higher capacity to provide the enemies marginal. Still wasn't quite above the line, um, meaning that the soils would have been able to provide enough had there been great mineralization. So. That, that's just one way to compare the three sites. Phosphorus was high on oak wood and coin farms, definitely not moving, and, and it was very high at the south of the field. Potassium was, was not moving at all, and those were the organic matter levels on those two sites. So during the season, we went out and we measured emergence, um, we measured yield, and we measured uh, silage quality. We also measured soil compaction using a penetrometer. We also did cornstalk nitrates on every test. And like I said, we looked at soil nutrient levels. So for emergence, this was what we found. <coughs> no significant differences this year in emergence on any of the, across the treatments, but the farms were different from site to site. This is what it looks like in a graph form that fit those same numbers. So at Oakwood, guided wasn't different from uh, actually at all three sites. Guided wasn't statistically different than manual, than four inches off and eight inches off, even though they look very different. Like I said, we looked at compaction, we used the penetrometer um, in the corn rows and between the corn rows, and right here what I'm showing are results from within the corn row. And at first, we looked at the data and we found no significant differences, and actually no patterns that we had, would have expected. But if Colleen is here, Colleen was here the day we did the penetrometer readings at Southview. We did this field together, and while we were doing it, we knew, gosh, this field has so many rocks, am I really not able to push the penetrometer in or is it because of the rocks? So while I was putting together the presentation, I thought, well, let's just take out the rocky site and see what that looks like. And I don't know why I kind of thought to do that before, because that's what that looked like. It's still not statistically significant because we only have two sites and there's lots of variability, but 
but that's why you do multiple years of these types of studies, so you get more <coughs> sites and more years. But at three inches deep, this, these were the penetrometer readings, um, the manual plots, the, or actually the RTK guided plots, the manual plots, the four inches off, and the eight inches off. At six inches deep, that's what those um, so penetrometer readings look like, and at nine inches deep. And when you, still, like I said, not statistically significant, but definitely tending and trending toward what we would have expected which was encouraging, because when we first looked at the data with the rocky site in there, it didn't make any sense. Um, like we had mentioned, there were three field days, a field day at each site, and the field days were basically held to discuss with other farms in the area, and so many farms have questions about this, do I plant over the slot, do I not, to get people to look into the field to look at um, what was going on and to make this an observational trial part of the study, the farms dug root pits on each of the, we picked four uh, plots, demonstration plots, and they dug root pits. So that's what we were looking at. Here's a picture of the root pit, some of the discussion. And I don't know if these will show up very well. So this is the RTK guided, and this is at the Southview farm. We're about a little over eight inches down, there was a yellow layer of soil that was much more dense than what was up above. You can see this <coughs> root mass underneath the, where the zone had been put in. The zone was also 11 inches deep at this site. Here was the manual. You can kind of see this root. It also made it going straight down. Four inches off. I don't know if you folks in the back can see this, but there's a whole trail of roots that went down below that yellow more dense structure layer in the soil, about four inches over. So the roots definitely seem to be finding that slot. And then this is eight inches off, so this dowel is about eight inches over from the site. You can see these roots, the longer roots are over where the slot was, um, and not growing long, or growing deep here on the That's what we were seeing during the season. We were all hoping we'd find results or yield differences. Uh, we dug up corn plants and put them in a row to look at the roots, and so this one's pretty self-explanatory. These roots represent the corn plants that were planted mm -hmm. right over the slot. These were the manually uh, guided, just look, by looking at the, the field, four inches off and eight inches off at two sites. We looked at nitrogen use using the cornstalk nitrate test and no statistically significant difference between the treatments. Differences between the farms, but not between the treatments. Um, actually, that was the yield. The yield numbers, once again, unfortunately, we, it was the first year of the study. We didn't see the differences we had been hoping for. Differences between the sites, but not between the treatments. why we didn't find any statistical significant, statistically significant treatment differences. They just weren't there. <coughs> so we looked at quality. Um, for quality, we looked at percent crude protein. We didn't find any statistical, statistically significant differences. We also looked at NDF, no differences. Some differences came up um, when we looked at NDFD. And those only came up at the coin site. And they don't, they also showed up on the next slide, which is another form of quality, the in vitro, the IVTD test. And that also showed up only at coin, but not even in the same pattern the, the, uh, that you, we had seen in the previous in this quality, the NDFD. So, yeah, I didn't <coughs> understand that data at all. And the only thing I could think about why there, mi there might have been differences between the treatments was that it was a late planted field and then late harvested field that had been rained.
rained on, there was disease, and the way the, the corn dried down differently across the field and across the plots may have impacted those quality samples. But they, it didn't show up anywhere else, and it doesn't seem to be following any pattern that we can explain. So I'm not sure that one. You took multiple samples? We took for every plot, and there were four, <coughs> so there were four four inch off plots. Um, and every single plot had a four inch sample. <coughs> so basically, for all of these things, we found no treatment differences except for the two quality parameters down here, and those don't seem to follow the pattern that can explain. Following the varieties, were the varieties all the same? The varieties were not all the same across the three farms. It was all sorts of different. So because there's this high amount of variability between the three sites, and we've only got one year, um, you can start to understand why it takes multiple years to, uh, especially when they're on-farm field trials, which is where everybody wants them, right. because that is relating more directly to what the farmers are seeing and doing on their farms. It's, it takes <coughs> more years of data. So by eye, when we were all out in the field, um, we saw differences across the plots. And actually, when Colleen and Kareen went out to do, is it emergence or kind of, what were you doing at COINS when you, you actually saw differences in the plots? <coughs> right before tasseling. Right before tasseling, you could see visual height differences across hmm. the plots. And that didn't come through all the way to the end of the season. So, in 2011, there was also a lot of variability across cornfields across the entire state. We all saw that in the early season, in the mid season, and in the late season when you're sitting in the chopper driving across the field. There was lots of variability. The late planting and their late harvesting of a lot of our crops, a lot of diseases progressed more than maybe they normally would have. So, just all more reasons to do more years of research. And the standard for agronomy research <coughs> is three years of yield. Lisa wasn't plugged out and lost completely. Right, right. So how many years would you guys want of data to, to make any, to change your mind about mm -hmm. any, a new technology? How many years of yield data? How many? <coughs> Three to five? I would like that too. So one of the um, positive, things, especially as we look forward, um, to next year, is that the farms we worked on want to do this again. This was the quote from one of the, the crop managers at Oakwood Dairy. He said the reason why he would like to see the, to do this trial again is because he was he was a participant. He saw how the data was collected. He had confidence in the data, and he was now that he had one year behind him, he would know how to do it better the next year. And he'd like to see it on his field. He would like to see more strip trials on his fields because when he does it with his his equipment and his personnel, especially if it's going to lead to a production change, it's just that much easier. I think if you're doing a project like this to evaluate especially cost effectiveness and economic wise, I think you would need at least five years of data to make sure you hit all weather type scenarios. Because you could end up with having two years of rain in mean, a good year or whatever. Right. And so this was a grant that was written. It was a um, NRCS CIG grant that was written as a one-year demonstration project. Um, we built into this project the platform that we would need to carry on for multiple years of a statistically valid research project to look at this, this equipment and planting over in the zone. But this is as far as we got. Well, then you could write that. a SARE grant for another few years, yeah. and then you'd have four years of data. That would be a great idea. <laughs> These are all very large farms. SARE often makes them large, <laughs> smaller farms. Does anybody have any questions? All right. I want to say a very special thank you. I don't know if any of the people from Growmark are here, but they helped us at the Coin Dairy. Uh, but they're, they have scales that they were able to use there, and they stayed there for the entire day. And we did eventually get out there to finish that harvest. 
And then also thanks to NRCS and CDG. So at this point, Patty, are you planning on doing it again next year? I would love to do it again next year. We need to figure out a way to, <coughs> to keep the, to find funding to do it again next year. That is the only holdup. The farmers are interested, and it seems like folks are very interested in this information, especially right now. It seems to be a good time to be doing this research. We had a lot of participants at the field days that were interested in knowing what was going on in the field, and right now we just need to find the problem. Part of the process here was trying to, to teach the farms how to do this on their own and, and still have statistically relevant data. No. All the farms involved realized that this was an odd year. All of them plan to do it again next year. We'll see what the spring planning turns out like. Obviously, that will have uh, some bearing on how much patience they have. But I think it's important that, that we get farmers to actually participate and, and get some real value out of it because they, they've got some ownership in it. The equipment's out there now that will let them do it and, and do it right. I think it was the first year that was built in the zone field. You know? Yeah. In two of the cases, it was the first year they were doing the zone field. And Oakwood was uh, fourth year corn. I, I think so. Fourth year corn okay. had been zone till two years before, a year and a half before. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then as, we, as the project unrolled, we also found out this spring it was really wet. And farms were using the locations on their farm that have been identified as places to go when there's nothing else is available, even if it's not the ideal place for putting extra nutrients. And that field had no manure applied to it twice with mm -hmm. injection equipment. So soil was pretty well mixed, and that was one of the reasons why we didn't mm -hmm. see much of a difference at all with that. Yeah. We, we didn't see any difference in the root pits or anything at Oakwood. We weren't really surprised that we didn't see yield differences there. We were surprised we didn't see yield differences at the coins in Southview because there were significant differences in the root, root masses. Did you guys or did the farm have any observations about the way that the corn grew? I mean, you said that you know, Rick for Rick for Castle it was a significant difference, but was there any showing, you know, like July when we had a really warm, dry spell? Was there any sign that some of the corn was more or less drought stressed or any other observations of that nature? Nothing was mentioned. Yeah, I didn't hear anything from farms mm -hmm. I would encourage you guys, we, uh, you have your regular survey, if you picked it up in the back, and on the back of that survey are some questions. As we look at this project and learn from our experiences this year, we'd like to get some more feedback on what about zone tillage, what questions do you have or do your clients have about zone tillage that you would like to see more research like this on as we, as we get ready to do this again, which hopefully we will. Um, we could add in other components or fine tune this research in these plots to look at things that are pertinent to the workers. So if you could fill that survey out, that would be great. And we finished with extra time, so you have no excuse of not. <laughs> <laughs> now you sound like a mother directing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Nice to meet you. There's one one shank two inches wide, it goes down two, and then there's usually some cultures in the basket range winners back there. They're usually only tilling about uh, 10 to 12 inch wide zone is where the main comes um, There are variations on that, and we experienced some of those here. 